want to thank Brewster for serving on the Authors Alliance Advisory Board and for hosting us here at the Internet Archive and for hosting the Internet Archive, which is so important to preserving our cultural heritage and to preserving the intellectual legacies of authors. And that's going to be an important theme of my remarks today as I introduce you to Authors Alliance. First, I want to make some introductions to my fellow founders and tell you a little bit about the history of the organization. The, the founders of Authors Alliance are four UC Berkeley professors. Carla Hesse is professor in the Department of History and Dean of Social Sciences. Tom Leonard, who is here, is professor in the School of Journalism and our university librarian. Pamela Samuelson is professor of both law and information at UC Berkeley. And I'm Molly Van Halen, professor of law as well. We are all authors of books and articles about the research that we conduct at Berkeley. We care deeply about how our works of authorship reach people. And first and foremost, we want them to be found and to be read by interested readers and to be preserved for the benefit of future readers and our own intellectual legacies. We've come to realize that there's no existing organization that speaks for us as authors and helps us to navigate the increasingly complicated environment in which our writings are disseminated to the public. So we decided to create that organization, and that's the Authors Alliance. Now, we started out by reaching out to other authors and to experts, and that group of experts has become our advisory board, which includes Nobel Prize winning researchers and scholars, authors of nonfiction, fiction, and poetry, and experts in publishing, librarianship, and digital dissemination. I hope you've had a chance to meet several of our advisors who are here with us tonight. We've also now recruited about 200 founding members who believe in our mission which is to serve the public good by helping and representing authors who want to spread their contributions to knowledge and culture more broadly, to reach today's readers and future generations. So our slogan is promoting authorship for the public good by supporting authors who write to be read. Now we're here in the Bay Area in the Internet Archive with all those servers blinking when I say that authors of the Authors Alliance want to spread our works more broadly, you're thinking, Brewster has a solution for that. The internet makes it easier than ever before for authors to reach audiences all over the world. So what's the problem that Authors Alliance is trying to resolve? Well, tonight I want to illustrate the problem with two stories and just one graph. The first story is about our advisory board member, Dr. Harold Varmus. Dr. Varmus is a Nobel laureate, former director of the National Institutes of Health, and a co-founder of the Public Library of Science. We are proud to have him among our advisors in part because he is such a prolific author of over 300 scientific papers and five books. One of those books is his memoir, The Art and, Sci and Politics of Science. In it, he writes this. Publication is the lifeblood in the career of a working scientist. Through publication, experimental work and thought become part of the fabric of science. These contributions to the fabric of science help to establish each scientist's intellectual legacy while building on the legacies of scientists who've come before. Dr. Varmus concludes the final chapter of his book this way, increasing the world's access to the legacy we have and the legacy we are building will be an important project for a very long time. Now, Dr. Varmus' memoir is part of his intellectual legacy. It was published by the W.W. Norton Publishing Company in 2009, and it sold well. But sales have flagged in recent years, leading Dr. Varmus to conclude that the best way to provide access to this part of his intellectual legacy would be to make an electronic version of his book available for free. Well, great. It's his book. It's his legacy. So what might stop him from distributing it however he likes? Ironically, the answer is in part copyright law. The law that is designed to promote the progress of science by securing to authors the exclusive right to their writings 
can make it complicated for authors to secure their own intellectual legacies. In this case, Dr. Varmus had assigned to his publisher the exclusive rights under copyright to reproduce and distribute his book. So copyright law combined with contract law could be used against him, the author, if he distributed the book himself without the publisher's permission. Now this story has a happy ending. Dr. Varmus consulted with our own Pam Samuelson about how he might renegotiate his original agreement. He sat down with his editor, W.W. Norton President Drake McFeely, and received permission to publish an electronic version of his book that is now available for free. He took action as an author who writes to be read to make sure that his work could be read by more people than were buying it in more places and for generations to come. Now, Nobel Prize winners tend to be pretty effective people. Not every author is so savvy or so well-connected. Not every contract can be renegotiated with a reasonable publisher over lunch. But many authors find themselves in similar situations. And part of our goal at Authors Alliance is to help authors manage their rights in order to follow Dr. Varmus's example of increasing the world's access to our intellectual legacies. Here's my next story. Katie Hafner is also a member of our Board of Advisors. Katie writes for the New York Times and is the author of six nonfiction books, most recently the widely praised memoir, Mother, Daughter, Me. Katie's 2008 book, A Romance on Three Legs, is the story of eccentric pianist Glenn Gould and his love affair with his piano. I'm in the middle of reading Mother, Daughter, Me right now, but I want to put this on my reading list next because it must be really good. To buy a new paperback copy of it on Amazon costs over $100. Now, I'm sure the book is wonderful, but another explanation for the price tag is that the publisher, Bloomsbury USA, is not printing new copies focusing instead on sales of the ebook version. Now there's a clause in Katie's contract that lets her get the rights to the book back if it goes out of print. But that clause is only triggered when ebook sales fall below $250 per year. Not 250 copies, $250. Now Katie is a savvy and experienced author. But when she assigned exclusive rights to her publisher, she did not anticipate this, her book in a cage, her inability just over five years later to satisfy potential readers, people who would still like to buy the book and read it in physical form. To Katie, this book was a labor of love, not a flash in the pan. After a modest commercial life, she would like it to have a long intellectual life. Even if the number of people who want print copies of it is too small to be worth the current publisher's trouble, she wants to reach those readers. And she could, in theory. She could find another publisher or self-publish using one of many print-on-demand services. But for now, her book, part of her intellectual legacy and a contribution to the history of one of the most important performers of the 20th century is caught in a cage of copyright and contracts. These stories do not represent isolated incidents. So let's turn to the data, which comes from Paul Heald, who's a founding member of Authors Alliance, a professor of law at the University of Illinois. And he's been gathering data on the availability of books on Amazon. In this chart, we see some of his findings, showing how many books are available to buy new in print. Not surprisingly, there are lots of brand new books. That's what publishers are printing and making available. There are also quite a few old books. Here are books with recently expired copyrights, which publishers are also bringing out in new editions. Now here's the interesting part. Books under copyright, the law that is supposed to promote authorship and its dissemination are becoming unavailable in new editions not long after they are published. I showed this graph recently to scholars gathered at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Many of them established scholars like Peter Stansky, the renowned Stanford historian who's a founding member of Authors Alliance and here with us tonight. I saw a lot of furrowed brows in that audience. Peter's giving me a furrowed brow right now. 
Why? Because these established scholars are authors of some of these books. Many of the books that form their intellectual legacies are out of print. In many cases, the authors do not themselves have the right to put them back in print or to have them anthologized in new collections or to make them available in ebook form. Now, librarians, like my co-founder Tom Leonard, are trying to take good care of the existing hard copies. They've also digitized some of these books in order to preserve them and make their content searchable so that potential readers can learn about them. But those efforts have triggered a copyright lawsuit. And so the authors of these books and readers now and in the future run the risk of having the remaining copies and their intellectual legacies crumble into oblivion. So what can Authors Alliance do to help save authors from the loss of their intellectual legacies? Well, we have three general categories of things in mind. Education, advocacy, and community. Education means explaining things like copyright ownership, contract law, and their consequences to authors. Authors who are experts in their own fields, but not in the intricacies of the laws that govern their life's work. Advocacy means representing authors who write to be read in debates about public and institutional policies that affect them. But none of this will work without a community of authors who band together to share experiences, solve problems, and make our voices heard. Tonight is our invitation to you to join that community. But first, my colleague Pam Samuelson has some more stories to share with you, including one about this photograph and a lot to tell you about our initial ideas for improving copyright policy for authors who write to be read. So with that, I'll introduce my colleague Pamela Samuelson, and thank you all for being here to join us for the launch of Authors Alliance. <laughs> 